I have a guest today, John Berger. He is going to help us understand about healthy buildings as well as energy efficiency, kind of what we can, what we need to know from, you know, our office buildings to our homes. So let's start with healthy buildings. Welcome to the Jennifer J. Hammond podcast. Jennifer is a licensed realtor, educator, speaker, and best-selling author. Jennifer's goal is to help you find your yay in every day. Hello, hello, hello. It's Jennifer J. I'm so excited. I have a guest today, John Berger. He is going to help us understand about healthy buildings as well as energy efficiency, kind of what we can, what we need to know from you know, our office buildings to our homes. So let's start with healthy buildings. John, what do we need to know to have a healthy office building? Well, I would point toward the Bullet Center in Seattle, Washington, one of the cloudiest places in the United States. And it's a six story office building that is probably the cleanest office building in the entire United States, maybe in the entire world. It has qualified for the International um, Living Future Institute's Net Zero Energy Building. And the building has um, what looks like a baseball diamond in the sky on the roof that gathers all the solar energy for the building and more so that the building sells back excess energy to the utility grid. It's funded with the help of actually using energy efficiency as if it were a real, you know, tangible commodity, energy efficiency as a resource. And that's used in the dynamic funding formulas that are used to make investments in buildings like this so attractive. Now, the building has an exterior envelope or skin, if you will, that's a little bit like the skin of an organism. And the skin is able to sense temperature and wind speed and sunlight and so forth. So it adjusts the building's heating and cooling and ventilating system accordingly. And it, it is a very responsive structure that minimizes energy use. It has geothermal heat pumps and radiant heating on the floor. And it doesn't have any utility connection. In other words, it's not dependent on any external power of so power source. It's not dependent on any water source. It actually captures all of the water that it uses from rainwater and it processes all of its own wastes. So it's kind of a self-contained unit. And unlike most buildings, it was built to last 250 years and all of the materials in it have to meet a rigorous standard of zero toxicity. So unlike a conventional building where there are lots of um, plastics and other uh, substances that can actually effuse or leak fumes during the lifetime of the building, the bullet center has none of that. And it's there for the duration, as I say, for 250 years. So it's both durable. I find it really beautiful. It's very comfortable. It's healthy for the occupants. And it produces something like um, $13 million in climate or carbon benefits over its lifetime. And it uses only something like 17% of a comparable office building. And it can be built for something that is also comparable. In other words, it's not fiendishly expensive to put a building together like this, but it does require a great deal of forethought and careful planning. And I can tell you more about that if you're interested. Well, absolutely. I wanted to highlight a couple of the things that you said. One of them was the idea that um, the building only uses 17% as much energy to a comparable office building. So to think about that, you could have, you know, if you if you use round numbers, you could, it's like five, uh, you could have five office buildings to one of these with the energy consumption, right? Right. At least five. That's true. And we can save a great deal of money as a nation by um, not only building new buildings to this kind of a, 
a high energy efficiency standard so that we're not wasting money and buying fuel and then setting it on fire. Instead, we use as little energy as we as we need. And over the course of the um, the entire lifetime of the building, we have very, very significant energy savings. And if the occupants of the building are paying their utility bills, this is a good selling point for the real estate agent who's trying to show the building because people know that their operating costs are going to be lower, their tenants are going to be more comfortable, and it's also beautiful. And this kind of thing can be applied across the board. We have 106 million buildings in the United States. I think about 6 million are commercial and industrial structures. If we would go through that building stock and every year transform maybe 300,000 buildings or something like that, I don't have the percentages at my fingertips, but who knows, a few percent of the building stock every year, we would be creating millions of potentially high paying um, domestic jobs that could not be outsourced and that would also be stimulating the local economy. So I believe that in addition to mandating that all new buildings get all their energy from clean renewable sources, not necessarily from their own rooftop, but that they receive the power that they that they use from clean renewable generating sources like solar and wind and uh, geothermal power and hydropower, as opposed to from fossil fuels, from coal and from natural gas. And I'm, I'm even skeptical of nuclear power in, in today's world because it's so expensive, it produces radioactive wastes, and it's also very highly centralized as a source of power, as opposed to decentralized and near where we actually need the power so with clean power sources from the elements, from the sun and the wind and the earth and the water, we can do everything that we need without radioactive waste and without nasty combustion byproducts. So it's it's really a win-win. It's a win, a triple bottom line for people, profit, and the planet. So it's a good thing. Well, and it's also profitable, as I try to point out, because we're saving so much money. And in, well, in the aggregate, you know, we're spending trillions of dollars every year on fossil fuel that we're just setting on fire. And wouldn't it be better to invest that money in a haste in, in a rapid or speedy clean energy transition and then you know buy the hardware that you need for the wind turbine or the solar panel and then not have to buy fuel for it every you know constantly every day well and let's talk about you're an energy specialist and an award-winning author so will you talk a little bit about how you got into this and why you're so passionate about it i got into this particular topic in a very roundabout way and I'll try and keep it short and sweet. But I originally, as a young man, always wanted to be a writer, wanted to write for the New York Times. And I also wanted to be a novelist. And Jack Kerouac and Jack London were sort of my idols. So I started out to try to write novels, but I found it was very, very difficult to, to get a novel published. And I thought, well, I've been to college, I can write term papers. And I thought, well, nonfiction books are kind of like long term papers. So I'll write me a nonfiction book. And I looked around to see what there was to, you know, that, that really grabbed me. And I learned from Ralph Nader and from his critical mass energy policy project that there were some problems about nuclear power. And this was long ago, long, long ago, I, I believe before you were born, Jennifer, and uh, I I um, decided that there were lots of issues having to do with nuclear power. So I wrote a book about it and I sort of self-educated on nuclear power because I had a liberal arts or humanities degree. And I was very interested as a result of that research in clean energy technologies. I'm, I know I'm very long-winded when it comes to answering this particular question. <laughs> I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to keep my my answers short for you, but I didn't really 
get to the crux of it in, in the in that nuclear book about 40 percent was devoted to clean energy alternatives and i got interested in climate change and i saw that clean energy was a solution to climate change and that we needed to really ramp up our investments and commitment to clean energy because i believe we're in a climate emergency right now well and let's talk about farms because i know that um you know a lot about farms and what can be done with farms to help right we're pivoting now 180 degrees to farm but it but it is land and agriculture is a very important um, um portion of of our economy and it's also potentially a way of reducing our um, atmospheric greenhouse gases today most agriculture is still run on the industrial agriculture model where you take a piece of land and scrape off the native vegetation and then douse the land with fertilizers pesticides, herbicides, and you grow whatever you think is the most profitable crop. And the only problem with this is that it destroys the organisms in the soil that are capable of taking um, nutrients and liberating them from hard to dissolve or access complexes in the soil. And also that make nutrients available to the roots of plants, which then take carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, out of the atmosphere and um, build it into their biomass, their stems, their roots, their leaves, as those plant materials and the roots in particular that penetrate deep in the soil die, they leave behind this legacy of carbon removed from the atmosphere. So when you have all these plants on the soil, they're little straws sipping CO2 from the atmosphere and helping to purify the atmosphere and remove some of the greenhouse gases that human industrial activity puts there. So how do we run agriculture in a better way that actually is more conducive to our environmental values and stewardship and also is more profitable? I write in my book, Solving the Climate Crisis, about a North Dakota rancher and farmer named Gabe Brown, who really kind of um, pioneered regenerative agriculture, which is a way of growing crops on the land in a way that produces healthy plants, healthy animals, and healthy food, ergo healthy humans, and it's also very profitable for him. He was going bankrupt when he was farming the energy intensive conventional industrial way. But then by combining animal um, husbandry and having um, flocks graze off the stubble of cover crops that he put on the land so that the soil was not just bare and fallow and subject to erosion, the animals, went over the land, much as historically the buffalo had traveled across the prairie, fertilizing it as they go and disturbing the surface and creating a heterogeneous environment for plants and also enriching the soil. So as the soil becomes richer in carbon that the plants pull from the atmosphere, it becomes a host to fungi and bacteria. And the fungi themselves live synergistically or with with plant roots and make the plants healthier and more robust. So this is like a virtuous cycle. As this gets started, the plants get healthier. They take more carbon from the atmosphere. The soil gets richer and darker instead of looking light at light brown and sandy and not having good healthy consistency. It has aggregates or clumps in the soil. So this is beneficial for what you call in scientific lingo, um, soil microflora or microbiota. So it's a good way to make the soil healthy. And uh, as I said, it, it creates a healthy ecosystem for plants, animals, and humans. Well, and a healthy planet, a healthy land, obviously creating healthy foods, 
helps uh, have us have healthy human bodies. <laughs> and obviously very important for real estate is if we have a healthy land and we can, you know, have healthy farms. So all of it is related. We're all tied together in one big ecosystem. So it's all very, very important. So we're just about out of time. I want to make sure that people know how to get your book and get in touch with you. So what is your website and any contact details you want to share? Sure. Well, my website is very simple. It's my name, John, J-O-H-N, J Berger, B-E-R-G-E-R.com. And then I also have another website, which it has the title of my book. It's called solvingtheclimatecrisis.us. The book is also available on Amazon, as most books are today. Just look for John J. Berger, Solving the Climate Crisis, and you will find it. And we're working on trying to get an audio book produced fairly soon as well. Excellent. So, well, thank you so much, John. You know good. that I'm always looking for the silver lining. So I'm going to ask you to lift your voice and say yay with me <laughs> as we go off air. Okay? <laughs> Three, two, one. Yay! yay! <laughs> Very good. Thank you, John. My pleasure.